Let's continue our conversation on Stoicism, going over the moral letters by Seneca. Uh, we did letter two last time, and letter three, I think, is a nice letter. It's about friendship and about confiding in people and how some people confide in others too much and other people confide in others too little. Uh, it's an interesting thought, but I think it's a, it's a straightforward letter. So if you are reading the book, um, again, I'm using the translation by Margaret Graver and Anthony Long, uh, you, you can absolutely read that for yourself. It's, it's really straightforward. Uh, this sounds, now I feel like I sound very pedantic when I say that. It, you obviously don't need me to expert, like sort of, uh, um, what do you call this, like explain all this, but it's a nice letter. I don't think I have that much to add to what Seneca is saying. That's a much better way of putting it. Letter number four is where I would like to continue. And it's a serious topic. And I think in many ways, this is a topic that a lot of people struggle with. It's the, 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 the topic of the end of life, of, of dying, of, of death. And um, I think Seneca has a wonderful way of dealing with those emotions. So letter number four from Seneca to Lucilius. Greetings. Persevere in what you have begun. Hurry as much as you can so that you have more time to enjoy a mind that is settled and made flawless. To be sure, you will have enjoyment even as you make it so, but there is quite another pleasure to be gained from the contemplation of an intellect that is spotlessly pure and bright. Surely you remember what joy you felt when you set aside your boy's clothes and put on a man's toga for your first trip down to the forum. A greater joy awaits you once you set aside your childish mind, once philosophy registers you as a grown man. For childhood, or rather childishness, which is worse, has not yet left us. Worse yet, we have the authority of grown men, but the faults of children, of infants even. Children are terrified of trivial things, infants of imagined things, and we of both. Just make some progress and you will understand that if some things seem very frightening, that is all the more reason why we should not fear them. No evil is great if it is an ending. Death is on its way to you. You would have reason to fear it if it could be present with you. Necessarily, though, it either does not arrive or is over and gone. It is hard, you say, to get one's mind to despise life. But don't you see? People do sometimes despise it, and for trivial reasons. One person hangs himself outside his girlfriend's door. Another hurls himself from a roof rooftop so as not to have to listen any longer to his master's complaints. A runaway slave stabs himself in the belly to avoid being recaptured. Don't you agree that courage will achieve what overwhelming terror manages to do? One cannot attain a life free of anxiety if one is too concerned about prolonging it if one counts living through many consulships as an important good. Rehearse this every day so that you will be able to get, sorry, so that you will be able to let go of life with equanimity. Many people grasp and hold on to life like those caught by a flash flood who grasp at weeds and brambles. Most are tossed about between the fear of death and the torments of life. And this is one of my favorite sentences. They do not want to live but they do not know how to die. Cast off your solicitude for life then, and in doing so, make life enjoyable for yourself. No good thing benefits us while we have it unless we are mentally prepared for the loss of it. And of all losses, this is the easiest to bear, since once life is gone, you cannot miss it. Exhort yourself, toughen yourself against such events as befall even the most powerful. Pompey lost his life to the decree of a young boy and a eunuch. Crassus lost his to the cruel and uncouth Parthians. Gaius Caesar commanded Lepidus to yield his neck to the tribune Dexter, then gave his own to Caira. Sorry, I'm so sorry. To Caria. I flipped that around. No one has ever reached a point where the power fortune granted was greater than the risk. The sea is calm now, but do not trust it. The storm comes in an instant. Pleasure boats that were out all morning are sunk before the day is over. Think, 
a robber, as well as a foe, can put a knife to your throat. In the absence of any greater authority, any slave holds the power of life or death over you. That's right. Anyone who despises his own life is master of yours. Call to mind the stories of people whose house servants plotted to kill them, some by stealth and some in broad daylight, and you will realize that just as many people have died from the anger of slaves as from the anger of kings. So why should you bother to fear those who are especially powerful when the thing you are afraid of is something anyone can do? And suppose you should fall into the hands of the enemy and the victor should order you to be put to death. Death is where you are headed anyway. Why do you deceive yourself? Do you realize now, for the first time, what has in fact been happening to you all along? So it is. Since the moment of birth, you have been moving toward your execution. These thoughts and others like them are what we must ponder if we want to be at peace as we await the final hour. For fear of that one makes all our other hours uneasy. To bring this letter to an end, here is what I liked from today's reading. This too is lifted from another's garden, Epicurus's garden, in other words, more Epicurean philosophy. Poverty is great wealth when it adjusts to nature's law. Do you know what boundaries nature's law imposes? Not to be hungry, not to be thirsty, not to be cold. To keep back hunger and thirst, you need not hang about the thresholds of the proud, nor endure the scorn of those whose very kindness is insulting. You need not brave the seas, nor follow the camps of the army. What nature requires is close by and easy to obtain. All that sweat is for superfluities. We wear out our fine clothes, grow old in army tents, hurl ourselves against foreign shores, and for what? Everything we need is already at hand. Anyone who is on good terms with poverty is rich. Farewell. I think it's a wonderful letter, and there's a lot in it. I think one of the, the very powerful points that, that Seneca makes is dealing with, with the fear of of dying, of the, the end of life. And I think it's something that, that affects all of us, right? We, I think we all think of it. And I've, I, I've said this before, but, but I'll say it again. I, I'm, I'm, I'm 36 now, and, and, and I, I'm thinking, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm not 18 anymore. I feel like I'm 18 in some ways, but I'm not. And that's okay. It's a passage of time. And imagine being 50, 60, 70, 80, etc. Time goes by and there's nothing we can do about it. There's nothing we can really do to stop our own death. We can do all sorts of things. We can try to lead a healthy life. We can do all those things, but there's no guarantees. And there is actually one guarantee, and that is that at some point it'll be over. You go to sleep and you will never wake up. Now, I really like what he um what he says about once your life is over you can't miss life anymore because it's over and that i think in many ways is a comforting thought now i, I understand that some people come into a discussion like this with a religious viewpoint of yes but there is an afterlife and maybe there's a heaven and a hell and I, I okay and I understand that that might might um, evoke certain anxiety right what, what if I go to hell and I will suffer forever well that's, that's a fair point I suppose if, if, if that is your your conviction but if you take death as well it's an ending of life no matter whether there is a heaven or a hell or nothing, once I pass that stage, once I de die and, and my, my body uh, ceases to be, my life as I know it is over. And I think that is that, that holds, irrespective of whether you believe in an afterlife or do not believe in an afterlife. The life as you know it is gone. How can you miss it when it's just completely gone. And I think that argument is most powerful if you do not believe in an afterlife. If you believe, um, to 
be honest, that's what I do. If you believe that there is nothing after death, then what, what really is there to fear? You are gone. There is, there is no more part of you left that will look back and think, ah, remember that time I had that really good steak? Because you're gone. It's over. And that, to me, it's not that I go around thinking about death every, every second of every day, but I mean, it, it comes up. I think it, it does for all of us. I find that a comforting thought. There, there, there is nothing to miss. There is nothing to miss because that stage has ended. And I have now entered another stage, but that specific stage is over. I will never return. That's it. And I think that that is a um, a powerful, for me, a, a powerful way of, of, of looking at, at this particular uh, topic. I also like his, his second argument, and I'll, I'll be brief about, about that, but his, his Epicurean quote, poverty is great wealth when it adjusts to nature's law. Kind of fits in with the idea of stoicism if you... If you're able to go along with the universe, with those things that happen to you, you can accept them as opposed to wrestling with them, as opposed to fighting against them, then things become a lot easier. I once saw an interview with a monk in Belgium who had a very interesting statement. And I had to think of that when I was thinking of going along with, with nature. He didn't quote any particular desert father, but he did allude to the desert father if ever come up with this argument. He said, look, in everyday life, demons will come in, right? And you can take that either, either as a literal religious thing, but also I think, I think he was really talking about it in a more figurative sense. Demons, things that, that haunt you, things that torment you. And I always liked the way he looked at it. He said, look, when they come in, you can try to wrestle with them. You can try to fight them. But the Desert Fathers had a different opinion on that. They said, let them come in. But if they come in through the front door, then open the back door so they just find their own way out. And that, that image... I found very nice because it's very vivid. It's easy to picture, but that's kind of the aspect of stoicism of going along with the universe. Something comes in. Now, instead of struggling, instead of wrestling with it, instead of trying to fight with, oh, yeah, and I did this wrong, and then, and then she said this, and then he did that, and then maybe stop there. That was a thought. People ruminate all the time. I, I know I do, right? You think back to something happened in the past and, and, and you, you're kind of reliving it. But what if when those thoughts present themselves to you, you open another door? They come in here, but then they just go out there. Instead of going with, oh, and I should have done, I should... No. Hey, that was a thought. What kind of thought? An unpleasant thought. Okay. And let it pass. And now I will think other thoughts again. I'm not trying to suggest that this is easy, but I do think that with practice, it becomes easier. This is one of the founding principles of Stoicism. You're in charge of your thoughts. You can control your thoughts or learn to control your thoughts. And that I found a very powerful strategy. Okay. Let the bad thought come in, but then also just let it pass out again without engaging with it. This is not the same as denying something or repressing something, right? Sometimes you have to do some work under professional supervision to work through things, but I'm talking about simple everyday things, right? Not therapeutic instances. So maybe, maybe give that technique a try. Let the demons come in, but then also let them just flow out.
That was a lot to say about that lesson. Some of these, again, some of these are longer, some of these are shorter. These are not even the longest ones yet. The really long ones I'll, I'll, I'll split up. That was letter number four. I hope this was useful. And um, I'd gladly see you next week for more talk about Stoicism and Seneca's moral lessons. Bye-bye.